The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. And we're going to talk today about the um, new points-based system as a result of um, Brexit. Um, hopefully, those of you who um, were on our last webinar to do with Brexit, when we touched on this topic, um, will appreciate um, why we left it for a topic on its own, because there is such a lot to cover today, um, and we hope you'll find this informative and uh, helpful to you in managing your recruitment going forwards. So first of all, we'll do a few introductions. Um, there's myself, uh, Sue Watson, I'm the HR Operations Manager at HR Solutions, and I'm going to be helping field your questions later on, and also to uh, manage some of the polls that we've got. And I'm the main presenter today is Victoria uh, Templeton, our HR Knowledge Manager, and we are ably supported by Atim in the background, who is helping to field any technical problems that you may have, and is helping to record the webinar, um, and she will send out afterwards copies of the slides and uh, a link to the recording as well. Um, as I've mentioned, we do encourage you to um, ask questions. We have had to mute you all because there are there are hundreds of you on the call today, so um, it would be uh, pretty unmanageable if we um, let it be a free for all. However, um, we do encourage you to write down your questions as you go through as we go through the webinar, and um, you should have a chat panel, something like this. And if you post them in there and send them to us, I will collate them and ask them, Victoria, at the end of the webinar. Um, we are um, going to try and make this as interactive as possible. We do have a few polls during the webinar um, just to um, ascertain where you are in your journey of um, trying to get on board with these um, latest um, rules regarding the um, recruitment of staff. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Victoria, who's going to take us through um, what we're going to cover today. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Uh, let me just get the screen sorted. There we go. Show my screen and we should all be seeing the title page. So thank you again, Sue, and uh, welcome everybody. It's great to see such a large turnout. So thank you for taking the time out of um, your busy schedule. So. Um, we are going to be explaining in detail today how the new points-based immigration system will work from next year. Uh, but before I begin, I just wanted to just take a moment just to explain that um, this webinar will be providing you with useful information about the scheme, and we very much welcome your questions, which we'll um, go through at the end. Unfortunately, I'm not in a position to give any immigration advice, that's um, out of my remit, but where I can help clarify the system, the process and how to manage it practically, then I'm, I'm absolutely more than happy to take those questions. And also just wanted to add that um, the information we're going to be discussing today is based on the latest immigration rules. So they came out in October and um, so I suspect that we may still get some further guidance from the government over coming weeks and months, but that I suspect is going to be more around the practical guidance. The actual principles of the, the scheme and the rules, as I say, they came out in October. So we have a, a full agenda today, so I just wanted to run through what we shall be covering. So I wanted to just first run some key dates past you to make you aware so you can help in your planning in getting ready to, for the new system and I'll also just give you a, a very quick update on where we are generally with the Brexit. After that I'll introduce the points-based immigration system and explain its concept and then I'll go through all the various ways in which non-UK uh, workers can come into the UK to work. But I will be specifically focusing on two of those, and that will be the skilled worker route and the intra-company transfer route, because they'll be, I suspect, the main routes that we'll be using to recruit within the UK. I will briefly touch on the implications of the new um, scheme for EU citizens who are in the UK at the moment, as well as British citizens who are in the EU. 
and um, you know an important part of this is actually to look at actually the recruitment process overall and so we'll look to understand how this new system is going to be impacting recruitment. Before we then start to bring the webinar to a close um, where we'll be considering actually what should businesses be doing now in the final few weeks uh, before it goes live and then finally as I say because I can't uh, be in a position to give advice around the immigration um, I can certainly direct you to external guidance that uh, will be well worth following up and reading to help you uh, moving forward so we have got a full uh, agenda today so um, as I said I appreciate you all taking your time out of your busy diaries so we'll kick start the webinar now and we'll begin with a um, uh, poll so if I can ask Sue to launch the polls for us and we'll start off with just asking a couple of questions that will help us with uh, progressing with the webinar thank you Victoria so the first poll we're going to ask is have you started planning from an HR perspective so there we go Most people have voted now, I think. Okay. So I'll close that poll and I'll share the results with you. So there. Woo. Okay. There's still quite a lot not. <laughs> There's a quite, yeah, 41%. And we would obviously encourage that um, businesses do start planning. And um, I will go into detail towards the end of the webinar, actually, to go through some of the things to be, uh, that you can start to do. There is an awful lot, um, especially with the recruitment um, side of things. So uh, we will be focusing on that later on in, uh, towards the end of the webinar. So um, hopefully that'll help those of you who have already started planning, but also those that haven't. So just alongside that, we just wanted to get a feeler for what your biggest challenges are at the moment. So um, with regards to Brexit and the recruitment um, side. Okay, I think most people have voted now, so I'll just Thank you. close that poll and share the results with you. So, oh, wow. the recruiting EU nationals, yeah. probably hence the significant um, attendance on this particular webinar. Yeah, yeah. It, it's <laughs> and, a major uh, uh, development, isn't it, for us? Yeah, it is, and, and, and obviously managing the ones we already have as well, Yeah, um, which is the second highest. So, um, yeah. And travel less so at the moment. I guess we've okay. travelled curbed anyway during this year, With isn't COVID, it? So yeah. um, um, maybe people have adapted to working, yeah. not needing so much travel for business, um, which could be a, a say a side side effect of um, the COVID restrictions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we'll cover all of these um, three areas in our webinar. We will spend a lot of detail and time on the recruiting of EU nationals and we will cover the EU um, settlement scheme which is for existing employees so um, and also uh, business travel so that's great to have your feedback so thank you so if I carry on I think that's the end of the polls yeah at this point okay so I said that there were some key dates uh, coming up that are going to be really important for you to uh, diarise and plan for um, I guess today where we are um, all I would say is around from a Brexit point of view is that the negotiations are still going on as I suspect most of you will have heard on the news in the recent days um, it is rumoured that the, uh, the negotiations are going to continue into next week but from a uh, deal perspective time really is running out um, and we we really are at the very end of the negotiations because we've got to bear in mind that the UK government have to ratify whatever it is they agree if they agree um, 
in Parliament. So, um, and that takes time. So, you know, the clock is running. 31st of December is obviously that key date. So, um, as I say, we are expecting the negotiations to go into next week. And I suspect we'll hear of major developments next week as well. So watch this space. And then in terms of the immigration side of things, what we do know is that we have the final immigration rules published. They came out on the 22nd of October. If anybody wants a little bit of night reading, by all means, follow the link, only 514 pages. So um, that has come out last month and the government obviously have a lot of accompanying guidance documents as well, which are a bit more user friendly. We then have the 1st of December. Now this is when the skilled worker route will open to applicants. And I'm gonna talk into detail about the skilled worker route, but that is a, an important date for your diaries if you're thinking of recruiting under that scheme. We then have the 31st of December, and as everybody will know, that's when the free movement ends. That's the end of that Brexit transition period. And so what it will mean from the 1st of January, people entering the UK for work purposes will require a visa. And that's regardless of which country they are coming in from. And finally, the 30th of June, and this is particularly important if you already employ EU nationals is that they have to apply to the EU settlement scheme in order to continue working for you um, after Brexit. So there is that transition period up until the 30th of June in which they can do that application piece. So that's a really important date. So in terms of the points-based immigration system, I just wanted to sort of talk through what it is all about. So after free movement ends, it will mean that if a person wishes to come to the UK, they will require that visa and it will be through this scheme that they will come to the UK to work and they'll obtain the visa through this scheme. So it does apply to both EU and the non-EU nationals. And the reason is that, you know, the government are trying to ensure that everybody is treated equally. It shouldn't matter where in the world people are traveling from to come to the UK to work. The new points-based immigration system uses the same principles that are currently used for the tier two general scheme that we already have in place. So for those of you who are not familiar with this scheme, this is effectively a visa um, route into working in the UK for non-EU applicants. And so those of you that do already recruit from outside the EU, then approaching recruitment moving forward for applicants from within the EU is not going to be necessarily uh, you know, different. It won't be something new. You'll be already familiar with it. So there are um, principles taken from the existing scheme. We expect the new way of recruiting from outside of the UK will have a huge impact. Um, and uh, there are a couple of areas. First of all, the, um, it's a massive change for recruitment as essentially the UK selection pool will be significantly reduced. You know, we won't have access to the millions of people from across Europe. However, the systems that they're uh, introducing from next year, they've aimed that they uh, are to make it much easier to obtain a visa because actually what we're seeing in the new um, points based immigration system is that a lot of some of the existing rules um, are being relaxed. So there are some efficiencies and um, simpler ways of working. Um, but as I say, from a recruitment selection perspective, you know, we're, we're, um, our selection pool is, is uh, reducing significantly. And then it's also worth adding, as I said at the start, we are hoping to have some practical guidance around the actual processing of the, of the scheme so you know as and when that does then obviously we obviously continue to update um, everybody with anything significant that comes through that so that was the points-based system in which um, everybody will need to go through in order to work in the UK for next year but there's various different routes in which you can come and enter the UK so the most common route will be your skilled worker route and then most probably the intra-company transfer route. So these are the ones that I'm going to go into detail on this webinar, given that they're going to be the most used. Uh, but I did want to use today as an opportunity to just let you know there are other avenues as well that people can come in to the UK to work. And as you'll see on the screen, um, 
you've got the international students and graduates, a new graduate immigration route that comes in from next summer onwards, startup and an innovator visa, a health and care visa, a creative route, a sporting route and youth mobility scheme. So there are many ways or types of visas that can be um, applied for. But as I said, the skilled worker route um, is essentially the main one followed by the intercompany transfer. Now, this table I thought would be helpful, especially you know, for those of you who may already recruit um, applicants from outside of Europe, this table is actually showing you how the government are merging the current Tier 2 general visa system into the new immigration system post-Brexit. So, from next year, both EU and non-EU nationals will need to come through these visa categories, which are shown on the right-hand column. And um, as you'll see, the left-hand column is the current uh, categories of visas that we're, we're used to and familiar with, so your tier ones, twos, fours and fives. Um, and what the government are trying to do is basically get consistency and equality um, throughout the, our processes for how we treat overseas nationals. And as I said a moment ago, it's irrelevant of the country they're coming in from. Um, what's important is that people are treated the same. So uh, the right hand column is going to be the new way forward from January next year. So now I'm going to spend some time talking about this skilled worker route. And there is a lot of information and, uh, you know, and, um, hopefully if you've got questions, as Sue says, just um, send them through as, as I'm um, going through this. So, as I said, the skilled worker route will, will replace the tier two general. And the skill, um, so it's aimed, uh, which the current one is only aimed at those outside EU, but now obviously this new skilled worker route is for EU and your non-EU. And so the new points system is actually going to be easier to use than the current tier two visa for several reasons. So we're going to see the skill level that's going to be required of your applicants being lowered. We're going to see the minimum salary that's going to be required also being lowered. There are going to be, or we expect to see, more occupations being covered by this scheme. And perhaps the most significant is that the resident labour test will be scrapped. So for those of you who currently do not recruit outside of Europe, the resident labour test is a current requirement that all employers must um, undertake as part of the process to be a sponsor. And um, it, it basically requires the employer to show an evidence to immigration and visa that they've been unable to recruit for that role from within the UK. And so they have to, as part of the demonstration, they do this by advertising the job um, on the Find a Job government owned website as well as in the private sector website. So that resident labour test is probably a, a, a major change and probably welcomed by many employers. So that's going to be scrapped. So we'll now look at actually what an applicant will need in order to come in on the skilled worker route. So they're going to need to have a job offer from a home office licensed sponsor. The job offer must be at the required skill level and it's known as RQF3 or above. Now that RQF3 is essentially equivalent to an A level or equivalent. That's just to give some context as a uh, skill. The applicant must also speak English to the required standard and the salary must meet the applicable minimum salary threshold. And that is um, either the general salary threshold that's set by the government, which is the 25,600, or the specific salary requirement for their occupation known as the going rate. So it's which, whichever is the highest of those two um, must form part of the uh, eligibility to getting into working in the UK. Now, where the job offer is between a salary of 20,480 and the minimum of 25,600, an applicant may still be able to get into the UK through the skilled worker route. But um, where they will, it will be because the job offer is for specific shortage occupation or the um, a PhD is relevant to the job 
or a PhD in a particularly in a STEM subjects, which is your sciences, your technologies, engineering and mathematics. So where the applicant holds any of those, they could potentially still come to the UK under the skilled worker route, even though the salary is lower than that minimum 25,600. OK, so um, assuming the job meets the required pay and skill level, the job applicants will need to score those 70 points. And of those 70 points, um, there's a number of them that can be um, traded and a number of them that actually are mandatory. So 20 of the 70 points can be earned by trading certain characteristics. So as you'll see on this table here towards the bottom half of the table, whether it's 20 points, 10, and then where I've labeled it tradable. And then the um, mandatory points are as the ones I've just set out on the previous slide where it has to be a job offer so they get the 20 points from that the job offer is at a skill level that's suitable so that's another 20 and then obviously they speak English at the required level so that's a further 10 so they've got the 50 points that are mandatory and they have to make up the um, additional through the other means as you'll see in this table here Now, on this slide, what I wanted to do was um, show an extract of um, the useful government guidance documents that can help an employer to work out the coding. So, um, essentially, um, as part of the skilled worker route, obviously, the, the job offer that you have that you're offering to that overseas national, whether they're EU or non-EU, um, will have an, what's called an S. So SOC code and this is just to give you an example of what the document looks like and I've put a link to it here so when you get these slides after the webinar it'll take you to that document and that that's a really important tool for you when you're planning your recruitment to determine what the skill what the code is for the job that you're offering to an overseas national now we have on this slide and hopefully you can see it clearly enough again it's an extract and I will provide a link again in the slides after the webinar, but a really useful tool is via the Office for National Statistics. And they have this coding tool and it essentially helps you to um, really sort of drill down and work out the, um, you know, the, the code for your job that you're offering and it gives you the detail behind it. So as you'll see on this example that I picked for marketing commercial managers, um, it talks about at high level, you know, what's expected from anybody that's going to be doing a role of that title. So they should be planning and overseeing promotion of services, um, dealing with the companies or brands, finding new business. And then it goes on to give some illustrative tasks that would be associated to that level, which would include things like liaising with senior staff, uh, to determining range of goods, um, discussing employees, clients' requirements, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a really useful tool if you're really struggling as to actually how you need to code the job. And what's probably also um, worth flagging is that um, the reason I think the government are giving as much detail like this is because obviously, as with any government scheme, they want to uh, avoid um, abuse of the system and, and things like that. And um, we all know, you know, visa and immigration can um, carry out checks at workplaces. They can go and speak to the overseas national, make inquiries about the job they're undertaking. And so um, that's why it's not a matter of just picking any old code that thinks the title sounds OK. You have to really look at the detail of the job to make sure it really matches the content of the job that that job holder is going to do. So, um, as I said, I will provide the link to this. This is a coding tool on the um, website of the Office of National Statistics. Um, so, in terms of uh, skills and occupations, um, the new points based immigration system will present more occupations for employers because it's going to be effectively lowering the skill level from your F6 to F3, which is your A-level equivalent. 
Now there are some examples of roles that are covered and those that aren't and you're probably spotting from looking at um, where I've put the tick and the cross on here that there are some probably irregularities or quirks um, and we don't have any rationale or reason for it. So let me explain. In terms of, as you'll see on here, um, you can employ a chef as a skilled worker but you can't employ a cook or you can recruit a PA or a secretary as a skilled worker, but then you can't employ a legal secretary. So on the face of it, it just seems like that doesn't make sense, you know, and I've got no answers to that. It's just um, irregularities. I don't know why, what, what's driving that, but um, it's just worth flagging that um, we've got these um, occupations and on occasions, it doesn't seem like um, it fits as it should. And what you'll also, you may have heard, uh, there's been some controversy over the, the summer and recent months around care workers, because as it stands, care workers do not meet the required skill level. But then as you can see, looking at this um, slide here, childminders, I think I've got childminders on, um, no, but childminders are included as a skilled role, but carers aren't. So again, that's another oddity that, um, is I uh, don't understand and obviously there's a lot of controversial because so many sectors in our in the UK rely heavily on um, European um, and overseas workers whether that's you know the care sector um, the NHS hospitality um, so um, we'll see it'll be interesting to know what happens I think in terms of the care sector what I understand from the research that I've done is that it's around the government thinking that actually they want to invest in the training and the development of our domestic workforce, i.e. rely on UK nationals to fill the jobs in the care sector and, and believe that the immigration system isn't the answer. Um, but of course, it's, it's causing a lot of controversy. So what I want to then just go through now is around how you um, manage the system to recruit a skilled worker because there has to be a, a sponsorship system in place. So as an employer who's wishing to recruit from within EU or non-EU, as I say, it doesn't matter, there'll be a need for the employer to hold a sponsor license from the home office and offer a job at the required skill level. There must be a management system in place which allows that employer to then monitor the foreign workers. Specifically, that would be in relation to perhaps their immigration status, um, the requirement to keep copies of the relevant documentation, tracking and recording attendance, keeping contact details up to date, and even reporting problems to the UK Visa and Immigration Department. Certificates of sponsorship, also known as COSs, are issued and the sponsor has certain duties if they're going to hold a sponsor license and have the ability to issue these certificates. So it is a requirement of becoming a sponsor that employers must check that their foreign workers have those necessary skills, qualifications or professional accreditations to be able to do the job that's being advertised and keep copies of documents showing the person's skills, qualifications, and um, sorry, um, certificates of sponsorships must also be given to workers when the job is defined as one that qualifies for sponsorship. And then obviously they've got that requirement to tell UK visa and immigration that it, um, if the worker is not complying with conditions of their visa. So there are strict conditions if you're going to be a sponsor license. And when employer fails to adhere to those conditions and the license may either be suspended, downgraded or can even be uh, removed. So before we move on to look at the other main entry into the UK, I just wanted to summarise because I'm very conscious there's a lot of information, but the key things really as headliners really from the skilled worker route is that the job offer must come from a home office sponsor. The job offer must be at the required skill level, as I say, the RQ F3, A level or equivalent. The applicant speaks English to required standard and the salary must meet the applicable minimum threshold. So at high level, there are all these sort of different aspects to the um, uh, ability to be able to bring somebody in through that route. 
So I'm now going to just cover off the next, um, probably most, um, uh, I suppose, relevant entry, visa entry into the UK, and most common one after the skilled worker, and that's your intra-company transfers. And some of you may have used, uh, as I say, the uh, current tier two intra-company transfer already um, in the old current format. But the intra-company transfers is going to be uh, is new named. It's renamed from the current tier two, and it applies to as as I keep saying, EU and non-EU nationals from the first of January next year. And this entry into working in the UK is about facilitating the temporary movement of overseas workers to the UK. And um, so, if you've got subsidiaries across Europe and you want to bring across um you know french nationals german nationals who are working in your offices and you want to bring them over to uk that's the avenue in which um you can consider as a way for them to work in your uk offices it is a temporary transfer but the applicant a visa holder can apply several times um so they can continue to work for you um for an ongoing period of time it will always be temporary um, and but there is ultimately a limit so they cannot stay in the UK for more than five years in any six-year period now there is an exception to that is and that's um, because of the salary so if they are on a salary of over 73,900 then the um, duration of how long they can stay in the UK um, increases and it's uh, nine years in a 10-year period so this visa is very relevant to if you want to bring um, European employees over to your UK office. So the applicant must already be an employee of your company. They must be sponsored as intra-company transfer by a home office license sponsor. So again, if we think about what I've just talked about with a skilled worker, there needs to be a sponsor um, who provides that sponsor offer have 12 months experience working for the business overseas linked by ownership to the UK business. Now, again, there's another exception here. And again, it's driven by the salary level. So uh, those on a salary of at least 73,900, they don't need the 12 month service working for the company, working for your company overseas. And they are undertaking a role at the required skill level for this type of visa, which is your RQF6. Now that is equivalent to graduate level. So it is this scheme is probably primarily aimed at your more your managers and above uh, type job roles. And there is a salary threshold, so they must be paid at least 41,500 or the going rate for the job, which is the highest, whichever is the highest. We do also have um, from next year the intra-company transfer graduate scheme. So that's very similar to the intra-company transfer scheme that I've just talked about. And it is to be part of a structured graduate training program where they can come over for up to that one year and different eligibility criteria regarding length of uh, overseas experience and salary um, will be required. But they, there will be an opportunity for you to bring in graduates from your um, subsidiaries over to the UK under that type of visa. Now, thinking back to the poll earlier, um, this was one of the uh, EU citizens in the UK was one of the areas, and it's um, how we um, do we need to do anything, and, how, and if so, what do we need to think about? So, all current EU national employees in the UK currently must apply to the EU settlement scheme if they wish to continue working in the UK after Brexit. So, um, you know, as I said earlier, we've got many sectors and, you know, we're a very diverse nation. And so, you know, for many of us, we do employ overseas nationals, Europeans. Um, and so this is really important because they're going to need to take personal responsibility if they wish to continue working over here after Brexit to apply for the EU settlement scheme. Now they do have a, a grace period, so it's not, not all about rushing to the end of the 31st December to get the application in. They've got until the 30th of June to do it. And after the 30th of June next year, if your EU national employee has not applied, they will need a visa to work in the UK. Otherwise, their employment's unlawful. 
Now, the thing with the EU settlement scheme is um, it's not the responsibility of the employer to require their employees to apply. It is down to an individual personal choice as to whether they wish to continue living and working in the UK after uh, Brexit. And so we can't force employees to be applying. Um, it's for them to make the judgment of, as, on a personal choice if they wish to continue and therefore apply. What is reasonable for an employer is to have dialogue with your employees because you need to be able to plan ahead you know from a resource perspective and so you know it's very reasonable to inquire and find out if they're intending to apply or not and if you know they are applying then at least you know from a courtesy point of view for them to keep you posted on the status of their application and things like that in terms of um you, you know at least that they've started the application but other than that um you just need to, um you know it's reasonable for you to just make have that dialogue that's ongoing as I said, you can't force employees to do it, um, but just um, to help your planning, there's no uh, harm in understanding if somebody's applied or not. And then in terms of the right to work checks, um, there's also a transition period with regards to these in that um, right to work checks can carry on as they are up until um, I think the 30th of June so essentially even though free movement ends 31st of December the applicant has the right to show their passport um, and the employer can accept it without seeing settled status after the 1st of January so there is a grace period for employers to carry on using the same right to work checks you know until we try as we transition into this new way of working Now, the other side of it is whether we as employers have British citizens employees actually working um, in the EU or, you know, traveling out business travel in the EU. And I'm conscious of this, you know, Sue said earlier around, you know, COVID at the moment, a lot of business travel, you know, stopped, if not all business travel stopped. But at some point in the future, it will pick up again um, and hopefully sooner rather than, you know, not too long. So. I just wanted to cover off some requirements here and some key points. So British citizens need a visa to live and work anywhere in the EU from next year except Ireland. Irish citizens are free to live and work in the UK and EU. So um, they've, they've got the ability to um, live freely, um, if you like, after Brexit. But British citizens need to live, um, need a visa to be able to work anywhere in the EU. Um, after Brexit. So if you have employees who travel to Europe for business, then start having to think about how you can plan for how the new scheme will affect their travel next year. EU countries do have time limits for visas uh, uh, in terms of, you know, they often allow a, a grace period, if you like, of somebody not needing a visa. Um, so it may be, um, I think France, I think offer 30 days of being able to work out there without a visa. Um, and each country is going to be, be different and have their own rules. So we would always advise that you check out the country destination in terms of their own time limits, in terms of how long your UK employee can work out there without needing a visa. But ultimately, um, depending on the time limits, essentially they are going to need visas to work out um, in the EU. And their passports must be valid for at least six months. So. That's the detail behind the skilled worker route, the intercompany transfer, and just acknowledging the impact for our European employees in the UK and our British citizens who may go and work in the EU. And so it's probably worth just um, checking in with you know the impact we're going to see as businesses now on recruitment. So I just want to spend some time looking at that. So. I've mentioned already that there will be a huge change to recruitment as effectively the selection pool will be significantly reduced. You know, if we think about the hospitality sectors, as I say, the care sectors and HS, you know, who rely heavily on um, EU nationals who are 
currently can you know work freely within anywhere in the EU so that selection pool is going to be narrowed and reduced we are going to see increased recruitment costs because what will um, happen is um, when you become a sponsor you're going to incur fees to become a sponsor you're going to incur fees for immigration fees and so it can be a costly um, activity to recruit from outside the UK um, and so for those employers who um, have been recruiting um, perhaps may have only been recruiting within the EU you know that's not really come at particularly additional costs to whether you recruit in the UK other than um, moving forward we're now going to see costs associated to our recruitment processes and the process so in terms of another impact on recruitment the aim is for this process uh, to become easier to recruit overseas nationals so it's one process one system um, obviously the type of visas will vary but essentially it's one process so essentially it should make it easier all round and the impact also on recruitment is, as I said we've now um, going to have the resident labour market test scrapped which will um, bring a lot of more uh, benefits to employers and take a lot of um, administration out from that we know there's a wider range of occupations that can be included because of the skill level that's been reduced and obviously we're opening it up to more roles because the minimum salary is reduced and um, so to enter the UK regardless of which visa route um, they're going to be need they're going to need to be sponsored by an employer they're going to have to have a job offer at a skill level um, a level equivalent um, and this is just like those um, for those currently outside of the um, EU now so for those employers who already recruit outside of the EU it's not too dissimilar I think the biggest thing is going to be the recruitment costs the fees that come with it and of course those are application fees as well for the uh, job applicant so we're now coming towards the end of the webinar and um, what I want to do before we turn to questions is just think about the um, considerations for what we should um, think about on our business but in fact I think we've got a poll now yeah we've got a couple yeah. of polls just to just to, yeah just to take away. a sound <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, we're just going to take a sounding from you so from today's webinar we just want to ask a couple of questions so one is do you expect to be recruiting from outside of the UK having heard all of that <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I think we're just about there now. I'll close that one and share the results. <clears throat> so, okay. um, quite a significant number will mm. will be expecting to uh, recruit from outside the UK, okay. despite all the challenges. Um, and then uh, alongside that, we would like to ask what you now think your biggest challenges are like, challenges likely to be having heard all of that <laughs> <clears throat> so similar to the one we asked earlier before the webinar just collect a few more results we're nearly there i think mm. Okay, I'm going to close oh, wow. that and share the results. <laughs> Let's see, yeah. So business travel's gone down, I think. Um, yeah. But the top two have, have increased in uh, in the kind of concerns or the challenge level. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's interesting. Definitely... Yeah, and I think um, for those of you um, 
that have selected the top two there, how to manage your EU employees currently and the recruiting of EU nationals. Um, you know, your planning is going to be key. And what I'm going to come on to now in terms of what we should be doing as employers, I think will also help um, in your concerns. Um, so if I carry on then, Sue, I think that's all the polls, isn't it? Yep, yep, I'll just... Yeah. It's back to you. Brilliant. Okay, so this really now, the last part um, of the webinar, is really thinking about what businesses should do now. And um, I think the important thing, the crucial thing, is going to be looking at you, reviewing your headcount requirements so that you can determine whether you need to start the application process to become a sponsor. So the Home Office are expecting great demands from new applications. And obviously, given the challenges of COVID-19, you know, delays with uh, processing times, it's going to be really critical that you, if you think you're going to be recruiting next year from outside the UK, then get your application in to be a sponsor, uh, you know, sooner rather than later. Um, I read last week the current wait processing times were about eight weeks. Um, but as I said, they are expecting great demand um, in the lead up. So that's your first thing. Review your head count for next week, for next week, for next year, <laughs> and then determine whether you think, if you're not already a sponsor, then think the likelihood of whether you're going to be recruiting and get your sponsored license in. So when also planning for your 21 2021 headcount, then make sure that you uh, budget for increased costs that obviously are associated with the recruiting from the outside um, because recruitment is going to be more costly. And also as part of your headcount planning, then perhaps talk to your recruitment team about the wider range of jobs which can be sponsored because of the changes to the immigration rules. And, uh, you know, as I said earlier, I will be sending links to the key documents where you can look at all the skilled jobs that will form part of the skilled worker route. Then consider the use of apprenticeships and kickstart placements. So actually look, think differently at your recruitment. So if the, the thought of the recruitment costs escalating or you know the processes involved then um, actually you know how would the apprenticeships and kickstart placements work for you you know utilizing these schemes may be more of an, a, a more of an effective recruitment strategy um, especially if your sector relies heavily on the recruitment of EU nationals and then also as part of your headcount planning con consider who in your workforce is an EU national uh, because if they are, like I said, going to want to stay working in the UK after Brexit, they must apply for that EU settlement scheme and they have until the 30th of June next year to do it. And just so just remember that you can't force somebody to do it, but it's reasonable to inquire and open that dialogue to understand their situation in order that you can then plan uh, your resources and your headcount and structures next year. Then consider the roles within your organisation that may travel to Europe on a regular basis. And I know travel is not happening now, but at some point we hope that, you know, it will be. And depending on the European country that you tend to, um, you know, have business travel going to, then that will determine the, the, the visa requirements and how long, if there is any grace period, somebody can work there without a visa. But there will almost certainly be a point where they will need a visa. Each country, as I said, has their own defined time limit. So really check those. And if you need to get any legal advice at that point, then um, get any, the relevant European legal advice. I would also then suggest create a business contingency plan just to address possible scenarios such as employees not choosing to apply for the EU settlement scheme or even if there are delays in visa processes due to the pandemic and things. So do a bit of uh, contingency planning um, as part of your um, overall planning for Brexit. And also think about developing an effective recruitment, uh, sorry, retention strategy, um, because this is going to be vital. If your business relies heavily on the recruitment of EU nationals, well, the new points-based system is going to be leading to higher recruitment costs and perhaps longer recruitment processes. So actually trying to retain your staff is going to be even more important now so that you keep recruitment to a minimum. So think about what kind of retention strategy you can um, you may need to have in place. 
and then ensure your company policies um, are updated just to make sure that any reference to any EU legislation is replaced uh, by a, a, and making sure you reference UK laws so one clear example you know GDPR is a new piece of European legislation which from next year will be um, adhering to the Data Protection Act of 2018 and all the uh, subsequent all the other data protection acts previous so um, make sure your policies uh, just tidied up from that regard and then finally communication I think is key because there's going to be a lot of nervousness there is all you know already now uh, with the pandemic a lot of people are feeling nervous um, with the fact that the Brexit negotiations are going on and we don't know if there's going to be a deal or no deal. A lot of uh, people might be nervous about the implications for the effects of that, uh, whichever way uh, you know it may go. And so this is a very unsettling time. So communication is key. So at all levels in the business. So help take your employees along with you engage with them let them know what you're doing to prepare for brexit um so that you can give them that confidence that you're um you know you're planning for it you're in control of it you're planning for any eventualities you know and just give them that reassurance as best you can at such what is a very difficult time all round for business and then finally, there's um, a Brexit HR risk audit that we actually have on our main website. And uh, if you're a knowledge base um, member, you can access it via there as well. And I'll include the link in the uh, webinar slides after. But essentially, that will enable you to just carry out a, a, a risk audit for you and your business in terms of how prepared you are um, at this point for preparing for Brexit. So I would encourage that you take a look at that and see if that can um, help you moving forward. And as I said at the outset, you know, unfortunately, I can't give uh, immigration advice. I'm not uh, permitted to. Um, I'm very much happy to take questions about the procedure, um, you know, the guidance. Um, but I would um, encourage you that if you've got a particular situation that you are needing immigration advice, then seek out um, specialist lawyers who, who can provide that. Um, but also there's a lot of free available information here. Um, it's all government links, um, but I've included this here. So you've got the code of practice for skilled workers, the immigration rules, and that's where you'll find um, the jobs categories. You've got the points-based immigration system, some further details there. Um, you've got an introduction for employers and then there's a further guide of recruiting people from outside the UK so there is so much information out there all I would say is um, you know just go to official sources like the government websites um, and um, you know obviously we're here uh, for any questions as well um, and no doubt that we will continue to be working on our pre preparation to Brexit and um, you know if developments we may put on further webinars so just watch out watch the space <laughs> as we try and keep everybody informed there we go and then i think i just brought this slide in as a final reminder these are your key dates so just um i just wanted to finish off with those because they are really critical and especially the 30th of june uh, because that's your deadline if you do already employ eu nationals so now is question time how are we doing so it's a few minutes before 11. um i appreciate everybody staying on listening i know it's um quite a heavy subject but thank you for listening and thank you for submitting questions so sue have we had many questions um i, I won't answer that just say are you ready um, <laughs> <laughs> um so one of the one of the first questions or what or a common question that we've had so I'll cover off a couple of the quick ones first and then perhaps yeah. we can look at some of the more uh, involved ones but um one is um a few people have asked how do we certify the level of english is who determines that is there an exam or a test that they have to do i i understand this to be a test that the government sets presumably yeah. that they have yeah. to pass yeah um, so as part of their application process so the applicant will obviously be they'll be doing their own application to apply for a visa 
um, and as part of that process they'll have to provide whatever documentation evidence and uh, that will part of the test will form part of that process we okay. the employers wouldn't be testing it no it's it's it's, it's not their yeah. responsibility which is a good thing um yeah. <laughs> and then we've got one around as you might expect around employing the non-skilled workers um first of all do we know anything about the costs are the costs for the unskilled similar or do you know if those have gone up yet so in terms of costs let's just have a look so um so your sponsored license fees i think are going to be staying the same so if you're applying then it depends on if you're a small or large business, but small businesses are the rates, I think, 536. For medium to large, it's uh, going to be 1,476, around that mark. Uh, that's okay. the current fees. And they define a small business where they employ less than 50 employees, 50 employees, or have okay. turnover less than 10.2 million. So um, the fees will be the application fees for the applicant, the immigration skills charge. Um, let me just check here. Yeah, there, it'll be the skilled worker and the intercompany transfer routes where they'll get that immigration skills charge. And that'll be uh, the first 12 months will be a thousand pound per skilled worker. And then it's additional 500 pound charge for each subsequent six month period. Um, and I understand that there will be some discounts available for charities and small businesses. And I would expect that the, the definition of small business, I mean, I might be wrong, but they've defined it above with a sponsored license, as I said, employing less than 50. 50 so yeah. there, there can be discounts available. Um, so, yeah, yeah so that's as much as I know offhand. And I'm guessing that the unskilled workers, that, that um, if they are EU nationals, they should I'll have to hope that existing staff would be um, applying for settled status so they can stay in through that route. But otherwise, yeah. after June, they're going to have a challenge with, yeah, they won't be yeah. able to employ them. <laughs> exactly. So this is why it's so important. And this is why the 30th of, of June is so important, because, you know, your current workforce, if they're EU nationals, if they have not applied and being granted either the pre-settled or settled status through that scheme, then they um, are they can't work legally in the UK and so therefore an employer that continues to employ them will be subject to fines and um, so it's really really important so effectively an EU national must have a visa um, from next year or if they're currently residing in the UK they need to have that pre-settled or settled status as granted through the EU settlement scheme okay thank you now to move on to one that I think you and I were actually discussing yesterday. So okay. <laughs> this is if a candidate starts working under an English contract before the end of the year but from an EU country. Yeah. Would they need a visa if they move in the UK next year? Because due to COVID, they might not be able to travel to move here before the end of the year. So um, they're just saying if they hold an English contract, they're already working for the company. But they're Hold not working here. Word. No, no. Working and I think that's the kit. They've got to be living and residing in yeah. the UK, and got to be in the UK by the 31st of December, which is the other key date that I put on my timeline. Yeah. And so, if there is any way possible to get them over here <laughs> before the 31st of December, you know, so they've got that uh, registered address, bank account, all set up, and they're living here, then um, they'll they'll be part of essentially uh they're still part of the free movement aren't they yeah. and they just have to go to the eu settlement status just to get the pre-settled or the settled status clarified yeah okay thank you um so the next question was about ad hoc business visitors do we know yet whether there's a limit on the time you can i, I guess for davis it's, it's not an issue it's just the normal um, passport checks but for um, do you know if there's a minimum time pe uh, visitors from overseas, potential clients and visitors, uh, if they require a visa to visit businesses in the UK? Now, my understanding, and 
Um, my understanding is that you need a visa to come here. There's no like, um, I've not come across it in the research around any grace period to come here for short periods without needing one. Yeah, unless you're under um, the graduate or one of the other. Yeah, yeah. Ones. So, yeah. Um, and as I said, you may you'll probably want to get your own uh, immigration advice. But my understanding is that if you've got uh, if you're wanting somebody to come over here for business um, from the EU, they need a visa. Yeah, and if that's to work here, I guess not, that's to not, work. Not, yeah, not to visit or to uh, prospects wouldn't wouldn't yeah. a client prospect clients wouldn't uh, need to with a normal kind of checks um, yeah. at airports wouldn't it yeah um, so then um, we've got a question around oh, sorry that was another English language one um, if they are employed in the UK with indefinite leave to remain but want to work in their home country which could be between six to 24 months for the UK employer what the implications be I think that's one of those where they'll need specialist advice, isn't it? Because um, I, I think so. They've got the indefinite leave. Yeah. Um, I think so. Let's just. But to work in your home country, you it, you you and for a UK company, you end up with there's tax implications, aren't there, in both the yeah. host country and the home country? Yeah. So that's where you need specialist um, immigration legal support. Yeah, to, um, to identify yeah. Uh, those it's, it's something we have to be really careful because we're not allowed to give um immigration advice um but um but yes definitely um takes takes some specialist advice on that one yeah. yeah and there are implications i am aware of that um it can get really complicated <laughs> can't it yeah absolutely <laughs> um Okay, somebody's asked, what do you do if you offer a job, but the ap visa application is then denied? I guess you just can't recruit them, can you? No, you're not allowed. Unless they appeal. Unless they appeal and um, yeah, you can appeal it, can't you, The um, if the application is denied? Yes, and that would be an interesting one. And I hope there will be some detailed guidance that does still come out from the government around the practical ways of managing the process um because what you know you might have to delay in that case if they've given you evidence that they're appealing it and the appeal's been lodged and received i, I don't know if this is a case but could it be that the the start dates temporarily pushed back to allow yeah. that appeal process that to be appeal. Yeah, and that's what I don't know. But um, so I'm hoping there's going to be some clarity around the practicalities of it. Um, but it's an interesting one. But ultimately, if an appeal was uh, was to fail as well, then yes, you can't continue with the job offer because you'd be employing employing an illegal yeah. worker. Yeah. Um, a question around um, somebody's already got tier two sponsorship to recruit medical GPs so it will be skilled workers do they have to apply again to recruit more skilled workers so more in that category I guess they would if their future ones fall into new recruits from the first of Jan so they say that again so they've already, so they've already got tier two yeah. they're already a tier two sponsor yeah do they have to reapply under the new rules from the first of Jan to recruit so more government... people Okay, so the government have said that if they're already licensed, have a license for a tier two general sponsor, then um, they can um, transfer it. They'll be automatically right. granted a new skilled worker license. Um, and likewise, what I understand, the government have also said with the intra-company transfer sponsors, if you do currently hold a license, you'll be automatically granted a new intra-company transfer license. So they've given that commitment. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, and sort of um, linked with that one. Um, so there's so many questions. I'm just trying to find the other one. I know was similar. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's to do with, um, you know, there's a requirement for a management system. Is this 
do you know if there any more about that? You know, to manage and to to keep track of um, the um, the kind of skilled worker or the the um, sponsored um, staff that you have. Yes. Yeah, so, in to, to my understanding, what I'm aware of is that um, there's obviously a technical system that you use with regards to um, the process, the government system that they've got. Mm. Um, but in, an in-house system or process that you need to adopt to keep on top of managing your non-UK workers, then you know you've got to find a system that works for you. But it's got to be a system. Uh, yeah most likely probably electronically um maybe some paper well there will be some paperwork as well unless you scan all your paperwork etc so it's for each company to determine how they want to organize themselves to manage it but what they need to just make sure is that they um they're checking uh the necessary skills qualifications uh they're keeping the copies of documents showing the individual's qualifications um etc so they've got to find their own way of how they're going to best manage it okay and and somebody has sort of pointed out that the other requirement um, for the skill work worker route was to track and record attendance yeah and that's that's not a requirement for all the other U employees in the uk so is that potentially discriminatory i guess as the government are, are saying this is what you well, have to do it's then. legitimate it's a it'll be interesting and i you know they're they're asking it for legitimate reasons mm. and so the justification of carrying out that attendance check is to ensure you're complying with your legal responsibilities of, of being a sponsor under the, under the sponsor license isn't so, it and i the think that might just be the yeah. justification yeah um, it's got huge um requirements on the employer hasn't it in order it to um, absolutely yeah to absolutely yeah. Because there's also a responsibility for an employer to tell the UK Visa and Immigration Department if the worker's not complying with the conditions. So that probably is where it's linking in then. So say, you know, they've come in, they've got a job offer, uh, but actually in reality, <laughs> you know, they're, uh, oh, no, they're not, their attendance is really poor and they're actually not fulfilling. They're, 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 you know, they've got to come here yeah, to fulfill yeah. a job. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, it would probably link in with your normal absence management processes anyway, wouldn't it? Yes, absolutely. You would absolutely. hope so. so yeah. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't do you wouldn't do a standalone attendance management system for your non-UK workers. You'd have just one absence management system, and that's your way of um managing attendance in general. In general. Um, and if you're ever called upon to um report back to the UK immigration department then you've got your data that you've kept and managed yeah um so um we're also being asked um is it acceptable to ask if an applicant has any visa requirements when we when they're doing in the hiring process um due to the fact that they're not able to hire anyone who requires one <laughs> Because they don't currently have a sponsor license. That's an so, interesting one, isn't it? So yeah. can you can you actually ask? I guess if you ask all candidates the same question. Yeah, because you can't but, discriminate, can you? So it's uh, I think that's where it's. Um, but it, if it's they about. if they say they do have visa requirements, then if they're the best candidate, I guess you then have to go through the process of being a sponsor, or can you say they can't apply? if um, they need a visa to work. I mean, we do ask on some for some clients, don't we, on recruitment, mm. um, them to ask a pre-selection question, do you have the right to work yeah. in the UK? So, um, it's a standard because you recruitment only, question, yeah. yeah. Um, so and I think as long as you ask question. it of all applicants, you know, mm -hmm. you're, you're applying a practice that's consistent, aren't you? You can't cherry pick who you ask that question to because that's where you're entering into your discrimination. Yeah. Mm. Um, so I think um, this preparing for Brexit thing as well is about looking at your recruitment paperwork and your recruitment processes to, to ensure that um, you're employing people that have got the legal right to work in the UK, which we do anyway through our right to work checks. <laughs> Yes, I guess it's <laughs> when the process you bring it in. Yeah, quite. Um, and um, 
is there somebody's asked if there's a time limit to get your sponsorship license i think you would said in one of the timetables didn't you uh, apply as soon if you knew, know you're going to need it apply for it as soon as you can because there is a I, bit of a oh uh, yeah i think thing. from what i heard there's a, like 30 odd thousand applicants waiting in the system and the the home office are expecting it to you know probably double um and so not only is the, the brexit and the clock's ticking but we've also got a pandemic so really you need to start thinking fairly quick if you're going to be recruiting from outside the uk because you're going to need to get your application to be sponsoring quick i would say get it in sooner rather than later yeah absolutely. in terms of deadline though it's an it's an open-ended system isn't it the points-based system will always be there but yeah. you don't want to risk applying to become a sponsor when you've got a real urgent need to get somebody in in your business you want to yes. be prepared i guess yes absolutely i think prepared is the thing isn't it yes and as soon as you can start preparing do it because yeah. um leaving it to the last minute means you could end up having a huge delay before you can actually start employing someone um mm. so yeah um so final question i think for this one if we if we haven't got to you we've got to most of them because some of them were very similar um we will try and come back to you directly afterwards um during the next few days if that's okay um but um somebody's asking if they recruit someone from the eu during december can they avoid having to undergo the new points based system or does it apply because the route opens from december the 1st so i think as long as they are so it, it's it, it's all driven by if the person has been living in the uk and is in the uk by the 31st to december yeah and you know so how long they've been in the uk it'll only affect the type of status they get granted so if you've been in i think it's five years then you you're most likely going to get your settled status if you've been living in there less than that then it's you're you're most likely going to get your pre-settled status so um you're going to have to apply for settled at some point in the future so all it's going to do is um it, it depends on how long you've been in the country yeah. as to what type of status but you've got to be in the country by 31st december yeah to get the settlement so, yeah which yeah. is the easiest route in for any it eu is. national absolutely easiest route in. it's um a very quick process um to go through um for to apply for settled status and um it, and it was pretty quick to get a response back and confirmation um mm. it's all done online so um you know that is definitely the easiest route is to get is to recruit everybody by the 31st of december and get them in the country by then if covid allows <laughs> um yeah. And because uh, to answer somebody's later question can can you get a settlement visa without being sponsored so yes if you're in the country by the 31st of december yeah. um they can apply for one and um if if um, someone decides not to apply i'm just answering another question um do they work and be dismissed on the 30th of june um well you can't ask for their settlement status evidence until the 1st of July mm. <laughs> so um, so technically yes you would have to um, you can continue because you can use current right to work documents for each EU national Absolutely. up until yeah. the end of June and therefore they're still eligible to work so you couldn't dismiss them fairly um, but come the 1st of July then I guess you're looking at an SOSR dismissal if they can't because yeah. um, you, you'll be in breach of legislation of yeah. employment um yeah. so yeah i think i think we'll end there because um there's a couple of really technical ones that we probably can't dig into here and um therefore we'll we'll come back to you directly with any links that we can send yeah. that might help them with those particular question um but yeah thank you very much for some really great questions there and yeah, really um, good. um really interesting and uh, i'm glad those of you who've also posted some comments that you found it really useful and helpful in trying to work through what is a very complex area of law actually um mm. so yeah thank you very much so thank, thank you victoria you. thank you for um for feeding fielding all of those and what i know is a very tricky subject <laughs> <laughs> um so i'm just going to take the um 
presentation back. I think I've done that now. Um, just to let you know, we are still doing webinars. Um, we've got one next week um, on the leadership perception gap. So Steve, um, a friend of ours from Engagement Multiplier, um, will be joining us to discuss a challenge that's lurking for leaders that can impact everything from employee engagement to culture to success during a period of change. So with all this talk of Brexit, all the changes that are happening to us due to COVID, there's no time better than now to look at your leaders. And um, whether or not you think your organization is suffering from the leadership perception gap, his webinar will give you a really, really invaluable insight with practical steps you can take uh, today to improve HR and leadership effectiveness uh, with what he refers to as the seven C's and we'll reveal all about those in the webinar. But he's actually gonna give you some free resources that you can use and that will help you overcome some of these challenges. Um, so we hope that you would um, be interested in joining us for a, a, what will be a very high energy and impact webinar. Is even posted, if you go to the registration page, there is a short webinar, uh, yeah, not webinar, video he has posted, um, just explaining a bit more about it. So do have a look and uh, hopefully we'll see you next week on that. We're also running another in our health and safety series. Um, so this one's kind of answering the age old question, why on earth do we have to do it? Um, you know, not um, just from the compliance perspective, what, what, is the minimum you need to do to make sure that you are um, working safely. We've also got um, another planning for next year webinar um, drafted and ready to go, hopefully early December. We're looking at about the 10th of December at the moment. Uh, we were just waiting for confirmation on a couple of other things as to whether we're gonna be joined by um, somebody else in presenting that. But um, watch this space because it, it will be planned. and. Um, we are looking at um, other webinars for web for December and for the early next year as well. So those will be, be posted shortly. Um, Victoria mentioned earlier the Brexit risk audit. We have got a series of risk audits and there will be some more health and safety ones that are going to be uploaded in the, ne in the coming weeks. They are free. Um, for those of you who subscribe to our knowledge base, they're available on there. For those of you who don't, then they are available on our main website as well and the links there on the slide. Um, we were talking about um, recently, we've, we've joined with Deloitte to Propel um, and we are doing a combined survey with, and we invite you to um, join us. Um, we're asking you all about the challenges you're facing over the next 12 months um, as part of research so that we can better focus our support for you in the next um, year. So that is part of the, it's the outcome from that survey that we're hoping to present via a webinar and we are looking at whether we combine it with um, the webinar we are planning for December or whether we actually run them separately. So if you would like to take part in that research and you'll get a copy of the report as well if you participate, then we will shortly be closing this survey. So, um, so do follow the link now if you would like to be part of it. Um, and just to let you know, we are running some um, say health and safety at work courses. We are running some um, face to face ones in a COVID compliant manner. Um, so if you do urgently need some training, they are running this month um, and early in December. Um, have a look on our website in the training courses page and you'll see those that are running. And we are looking at potentially trying to uh, run some virtual ones next year. Um, finally, I mentioned Engagement Multiplier. They do do a fantastic employee engagement survey that um, you can do free, the first one, and then see how it goes. And if you wish to conduct them quarterly to see how you progress with your engagement following taking any actions that come out of it, um, then it is a very low cost option for um, helping to engage your staff. And it really does work and it gives you some um, information on, on what they are looking for, what they need, what more they need, so you can target your, your support to staff, um, target your, um, your strategy as well around keeping your teams engaged to enable you to have a more successful business. Finally, if you don't already, um, we invite you to sign up for our newsletters so that we can keep you posted as we um, um, add more webinars or as we um, 
the government brings out new updates and um, we will keep you informed as they as we go through and as always we welcome your feedback um because it helps to inform us how we um how we move forward and and what sort of support we give you so please do send let us know um how we can help and finally just to say thank you to you all um you've been an amazing um audience today we've had a huge number attend the webinar one of our most popular since the whole covid um, process started <laughs> and um we hope that uh, it's helped to fill some of the gaps and some of the questions that you may have had going forward and um, so thank you very much thank you and thank yeah, you thank to victoria you. oh you're welcome <laughs> thank you everybody for joining